This is a very special evening. One of the great parts about doing a show like this is you get a chance to meet and to talk and to sit with, in effect, whether it be virtually or in real time, a lot of really interesting people, the type of people you'd love to well, bend an elbow at, as they used to say, perhaps attend a cocktail party or a dinner party with. But I get to do it live, and I get to bring it to all of you. I want to preface the introduction of our first guest with sort of a, a little bit of a background story. I graduated high school in 1978 on the wrong side of the Holland Tunnel, that part of New Jersey that will never be confused with the Garden State, both environmentally or intellectually. I know where that giant Exxon sign is on Highway Route 1 and 9 that Bruce Springsteen sang of. You could say that the skies were on fire as you drove through Elizabeth, the town I was born in. Yeah, I'm from that part of New Jersey. And as a young man in high school, and yes, uh, true confessions, I occasionally cut school and went into New York City. New York City was a city in transition at that time. Greenwich Village had really kind of lapsed into recent memory. The beat era was long gone. This was post-Vietnam War protests. In the 1970s, of course, you would all know it for Studio 54, the disco scene. But there was a burgeoning nascent lower Manhattan scene that I got to see rise live and in person. In doing so, for a young man who graduated from a public school in a, a very nice, but a, definitely a mill town environment, kind of like Pawtucket in New Jersey, I got to see and experience and read about and live things you only saw in the movies. A few years later, a, a really bad movie called Desperately Seeking Susan with Madonna and what was to be her beginning career of her st as a star, as a movie star, took place in a club called Danceteria, which was in the lower West 20s that I used to hang out at. Every summer, the fourth floor, and then ultimately, when, they, when it warmed up a little bit, the ceiling was turned into a thrash punk club. So you would take an elevator up to the ceiling of about a 25-story building, listen to live punk music as you looked over what was then a pre-Disney, post-apocalyptic New York City. The movie Escape from New York was in the theaters, and it was a little bit closer to the truth than folks here in the burbs and the outer boroughs of New England might think so. The city was in financial decline, but I have to tell you the music scene, whether it be Max's, CB's, ultimately then the Ritz, the Broom Street Tavern, Finelli's over on Prince Street, a bunch of bars on Canal Street. Soho was beginning to emerge as a legitimate art district. This is decades before it became the tourist whelp trap that it is right now. People of that age didn't flock to Brooklyn at that time. They flocked to Lower Manhattan, where a burgeoning punk scene had eclipsed folks' music and led it to what folks here in the burbs was known as the 90s. My guide through those years was a publication called The Village Voice, which I discovered one of the first times I cut school in about 1977. The Village Voice had everything. For folks here local to Providence, you might talk about the Providence New Paper, ultimately the Phoenix. Well, it was that on steroids. The leading rock critics of the day held forth there. A gentleman by the name of Nat Entoff, who recently passed, a First Amendment writer who wrote to me what he called free speech for me but not for the shaped my entire life's perspective on the First Amendment. And also how to behave and or misbehave as a civic and civil rights and civil liberties activist. It was said about Nat Entoff that he somehow managed to piss everybody off. He managed to piss off Everyone from the Catholic Church to the city of New York to big business to higher education. Nat Hentoff presaged what we now recognize as a legitimate crisis in free speech. Organizations like FIRE last week are working to address. He was on the first wave of reporting of that. Everything you wanted was in the village voice. It was a life-affirming document for this 17-year-old who already had his ink-stained, wretch-like hands clutched around that paper every week. It was put out in press boxes at one point. 
People would line up for that newspaper. This is pre-internet, of course. People would line up for this newspaper for two reasons. First of all, there was no better way, short of reading the obituaries, to find out where the best apartments were, particularly in lower Manhattan. And everything you wanted was in this one paper. It's what one of those papers that America made America great, made journalism great, and really defined the notion and the mission of the alt-weekly. It's gone through some changes since then. I mentioned this as a sideline to our to the guest I'm about to introduce, only because he writes for and, and edits for that very same village voice. We probably know him better here in Rhode Island for our, the book he wrote, which is often considered the Bible, the primer, the introductory lessons, everything you need to know about big sports economics, stadiums, the underlying politics, the underlying logic or a lack of the above, and is a source of the earliest history of big sports economics. And of course, I'm talking about Field of Schemes. His name is Neil DeMoss. He's a Brooklyn-based journalist, a writer, editor of The Village Voice. He routinely contributes to fairness and accuracy in reporting, CNNMoney.com, baseball prospectus, amongst a wide range of publications. He's joining us on the coalition this week. This is something we've been working on for months because of, he is widely in demand. Lectures at the Columbia University School of uh, Graduate School of Journalism on sports economics. And really, to me, is the capping event on the coalition as we continue to fight the billionaire baseball club with, as we love to say here, their wet Fenway dreams. We'll talk more about that later in the show, but it is my unparalleled pleasure and honor to introduce Neil DeMoss to the coalition. Neil, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I should have put that uh, that intro up on speakerphone so the whole office could hear it. That would have been not a dry eye in the house. Um, I, I I just have to say, I want to talk about your, your book and sports, but um, it's a remarkable publication. Um, I, now, I know you guys are going through a transition. Um, listen, my daughter, uh, is a graduate of a certain college on the Upper West Side. They went online a couple of years ago. It's just, it's just the way it is. And if it, if you continue that same mission, folks like me, you know, I don't care at this point whether it's digital or I can bring it up on my, my, my iPad or, or, or smartphone. The point is, it's there. Columbia University Journalism School is part of this year's Columbia um, graduation. I happen to be there. When they were introduced by the dean to the president of Columbia to request the right to graduate, it's, it's this couple hundred year old tuition, uh, I'm sorry, tradition that they do. Um, in one of me, as, as someone who's a huge fan of journalism and is a huge fan of the written word and understands its importance more so now than ever, all right, they, and, and, and it's, hard to, it's hard to really describe this to, to, the, to the viewer or listener, but as he was making his speech, I think we've all been to a football game where people flip their cards around and they say, you know, go Pats or go Giants. Spontaneously, what's planned by the students, unbeknownst to both the dean and the rest of the school, they flipped over cards which spelt in giant letters one word. That word was truth. And to me, the village voice over generations now has been one of the leaders in presenting truth both to the city of New York and to the people at large, who are privileged enough to read it. So, you know, I, I, you know, obviously it's an emotional subject for me, but um, I can argue successfully, and you can talk and talk, um, that I stood in front of a, a meeting this week and addressed a room full of corporate cronies, and I thought of you, legitimately thought of you guys as I was making that speech, because what you guys presented have done so over a generation now was formative for me and how I approach just about everything in politics. So yeah, no, I, would, I would say for, I would say for me too. You know, I mean, I, I grew up in the '70s and '80s in New York, exactly the same. And uh, and you know, it was absolutely a formative experience to see you know what was showing up in the in the voice every week. Um, and I'm privileged to be here, and hopefully, you know, we'll all be privileged to be part of the voice for for you know generations more. I mean, that's that's the goal anyway. Um, but um, but yeah, but uh, happy to talk about stadiums. Absolutely, um, absolutely. But, you know, that's probably of more interest to, 
to, uh, well, I don't know. I don't want to say that your listeners aren't just interested in the voice, but uh, it's a more pressing issue, some more pressing issues around the stadium. Right. Uh, and particularly here in New England, where we are on the brink of a, a feel-good tour by the House, I'm sorry, the Rhode Island State Senate's Finance Committee, um, to, uh, to once again, and, and the analogy I often draw is that of Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction, she rose up out of the bathtub once again in an attempt to, at this point, get about a $40 million plus state subsidy from Rhode Island. And astonishingly enough, uh, a 20 plus million dollar state subsidy from a city like Pawtucket, Rhode Island. If I was to draw an analogy between Pawtucket and, say, Long Island or New York, sort of like a New Rochelle or a, uh, or a Uniondale. Um, a wonderful town, wonderful people, definitely a mill town, definitely a middle class kind of town. Um, again, and, and amazingly enough, and then I'd love it at some point if, as in your tours if you shared this anecdote, the city of Pawtucket is actually contemplating collateralizing this in, quote unquote investment with future ongoing state aid. Imagine that, a mill town which is broke, pledging state aid to support debt to build a stadium for Larry Lacchino. I, <laughs> wow. Yeah, well, it's unfor unfortunately not uncommon, you know. I mean, there are plenty of there are plenty of cities across the country that are in you know anywhere from good to dire financial straits mm -hmm. and that are pledging you know uh, scarce money to sports facilities either because you know they're convinced that it's going to be a you know, good economic investment, or they're afraid the team, the team is going to leave, um, which, as in Pawtucket, you know, the, the, it often is the case that you're not really sure whether it's a real threat or not, you know, is, mm -hmm. is the team really going to go to Worcester, or is it just that, uh, you know, somebody drove up the, you know, highway to Worcester and paid a visit and is now, you know, trying to stir up that threat. Um, so, you know, it's, it's unfortunately not uncommon, you know, it's this we detailed both in our book and on the website, you know, for in both big cities and small. Um, this is how the sports business industry, you know, works right now is, you know, you don't just make money by selling tickets, you make money also by trying to extort money from the public. And it's uh, something that's been going on pretty much about 30 years right now. Right. And it doesn't certainly kind of slowing down. And, you know, if I were a sports team owner, I wouldn't, you know, hesitate to ask for this kind of money, too. Because, man, you know, $40 million in free money? <laughs> Even if you're a rich guy, you know, it's not something you pass up. Right. Now, I, interestingly enough, um, Kurt Schilling was recently uh, interviewed here. Kurt Schilling of the uh, 38 Studios, a, an investment that right. the state underwrote in to the tune of 100 plus million dollars. Kurt Schilling, during the interview, I had an opportunity to uh, call in with a question. I asked him if he found it to be um, hypocritical that he was potentially running as a conservative Republican Senate candidate. How did that jive with his, well, his history during the 38 Studios episode? His counter to me was fascinating. He, you know, he mentioned that as an investor and as a business owner, his responsibility first and foremost was to his investors and his employees. And when offered the money, of course he would take it because ultimately, what could go wrong? Nothing would go wrong. His investment was sound. He had a, a firm belief in the future of 38 Studios. But he also added, in pure Kurt Schilling style, because Kurt Schilling is the gift that keeps on giving, or as they say in the radio business, he is radio gold. He added that if he were governor, he never would have offered the deal. And, and, and I think his, that, ah. that whole statement is so compelling. Yeah. Because if given the opportunity, as a quote unquote capitalist, and I'm using air quotes here, of course if someone offers you money and it's legal, you're, you're going to take it. But your book, Field of Schemes, you really trace, and you talk about the 30 year time span, you're right on target, it's about 33 years since the Baltimore Colts, and yes, listener, millennial listeners, they were the Baltimore Colts before they were the, the uh, Indianapolis Colts. <laughs> you, know? you actually trace the origins of this whole sports, big business, big bucks, rooting for laundry movement back to then. Tell me a little bit about that time and if you can reflect on just how important that was in terms of the mind, not mindset of both sports fans and industrialists. You know, I think it was sort of an evolutionary moment, right, where um, uh, the Colts 
owner at the time both real, you know, realized that uh, he could extract a whole lot of free money by either threatening to move or moving to Indianapolis. Indianapolis realized that they could get a team just by offering to build a new stadium. Um, and then, you know, it started this uh, this sort of cascade effect, right, where then Baltimore was looking for a new team, and, um, you know, other cities were, sort of realized, were saying, oh, you know, or other teams were saying to their cities, rather, oh, you know, you don't want to uh, have happened to you what happened to Baltimore, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it started to be seen as this as this more legitimate threat. But at the same time, no, it was, it, this was the 80s. This was a time when you had just seen huge cutbacks in federal aid to cities um, as, you know, part of the sort of Reagan retrenchment. And you had um, cities, eat, you know, trying to figure out what they could do to try and, uh, uh, you know, boost their own local economies, um, you know, especially sort of, sort of Rust Belt cities, right, that weren't doing that well in the, in the recession in the 80s. And a lot of the cities came, you know, city mayors and, and, uh, and you know, state legislatures and things like that started realizing, well, you know, one thing we could do is just offer tax breaks, right? Because mm-hmm. you know, we don't have anything else going on. We'll just offer some tax breaks or offer some cash or something like that and try and get companies to move to our cities. Um, that didn't work very well. Um, it started, you know, kind of a, a bidding war where you had uh, different cities going back and forth and, uh, and uh, you know, bidding against each other, trying to steal companies back and forth from each other. Half the time, they wouldn't even stay very long. Um, and that's, you know, the trend that has now led we see to, you know, Amazon saying, hey, we'll build our second corporate headquarters <laughs> to whoever offers us the most money, right? right. We've got that cities across the North America saying, hey, sign us up. We'll give you lots of money. Um, <laughs> but that very quickly spent sports, you know, and then you had, again, you know, you had the, the Colts, you had the Orioles coming right after the Colts saying, uh, well, you know, the Colts, you don't want to don't lose us too. Um, you know, you had, uh, you know, more and more cities across the country um, where teams were starting to to use that threat, to use that, again, that argument of it's not just keeping your team, it's not just keeping your team happy, it's also economic development. Right. And that was sort of a new argument, right, was mm-hmm. that um, you're doing this in order to, uh, to boost the local economy. It, it, immediately, economists started looking at it and discovering that there was no truth to it at all. You know, you build a new sports facility mm-hmm. and nothing happens to the local economy. Sales tax receipts don't go up. Per capita income doesn't go up. Jobs, maybe they go up by a handful, but the cost is like, you know, a quarter million dollars per job created or something right. ghastly like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, but still, you know, that was that was one of the arguments and you sort of end up with the, you know, like we have in our book in chapter four, The Art of Steel, um, you know, the, the sort of playbook includes it's going to be a good economic investment and then people say, well, we don't know about that. You say, well, but the team will leave if not. And then, well, oh, I don't know if the team's going to leave. Yes, but the team can't compete if not. You keep cycling through these things over and over again and you do it for enough years and you usually will find some level of government that will crack. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there are a few exceptions where, where citizens have pushed back, but um, it's very difficult to, you know, fight against the kind of, uh, you know, sports political complex that is, uh, has been, you know, funneling now a couple billion dollars a year right. that goes into sports facilities and public money. If you're a fan of The Simpsons, of course, you would know that it's a Shelbyville idea. Maybe not a Springfield idea, but a Shelbyville idea. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, the irony is twofold in, in the case of Maryland. Number one, by no means had Baltimore as a city had been unfriendly to the Colts. As I, my memory serves me correctly, Baltimore had just spent several million dollars uh, in renovations for Memorial Stadium. Um, and at the same time, and, and you see where the trend begins, Baltimore was completely willing to act in the same manner, in a sense, that had been used against them. They, they, they saw no shame or, or no harm. They, uh, on one moment, they cried foul. And as you remember, I believe they even took cases to federal court to try and fight this. Um, folks, and by the way, just as a backdrop, we, the, the, the term leaving in the middle of the night can on one level be stretched to the Baltimore Colts because literally they packed up tra- tractor trailers with their equipment in the middle of the night. Word spread amongst around the city, and as they were leaving, uh, private security guards kept a crowd at bay at the stadium and and understand too that the cult like appeal of the cult like appeal I should say of the Baltimore Colts 
is akin to that locally of say how feel, people feel about the Red Sox. Um, this was not just a team. This was clearly part of the fabric of this community uh, in a way that I don't even think is possible now. Uh, the term, of course, rooting for laundry comes from that great Seinfeld skit. But so many promises are made on this. And, and the term du jour this year, and I know what is the Oxford Dictionary every year uh, takes a term and removes it from the English language. I hope they'll do this. Uh, ancillary development. Um, I, I always challenge politicians to explain exactly what that means. I don't know. I think they do know. Um, they've clearly never read Samuelson or any one of a number of freshman economics books. But talk about ancillary development. Do, does it ever really happen? Um, the answer is that it happens when it's going to happen anyway. It's a short answer. I mean, right. you know, the whole idea of this is that, you know, it is sort of the, if you build it, it will, it will come concept, right? If, right. You, if you build a sports facility, then people will suddenly come and say, wow, that's a great district, right? We, we want to be near a near the baseball stadium or the basketball arena, and so you're going to get all this new housing and commercial development and office space and things like that. Um, you can already, if you're thinking about it, find a problem with this reasoning, which is who on earth builds anything because you want to be near a baseball stadium, right? I mean, or a sports facility. Um, when there's a game on, it's super noisy. There's a ton of traffic. Um, you know, there's tons of people on the street, which I, I guess is good if you're trying to run some business like a restaurant or a sports bar. Um, although I've also spoken to sports bars um, who have said, you know, um, who are in your stadium and said, you know, we close on game days because there's just <laughs> no way to seat everybody. I think, I think this is actually a restaurant, not a sports bar, but they were like, you know, there's like, you know, 60,000 people streaming past in like 20 minutes. There's nowhere, no way to actually seat everybody um, that, uh, you know, like would want to eat here and then they're gone. Um, I talked to, for, for my other book, Brooklyn Wars, I talked to um, a guy who runs a pizza place around the corner from uh, the Brooklyn Nets Arena in her, here in Brooklyn. And he said, yeah, we do really well because we can serve people really fast because we make pizza. <laughs> you know, the guys across the street who run a sit-down restaurant do terribly because nobody wants to come and like sit, spend like, you know, an hour and a half eating dinner between, you know, getting out of work and you know, getting to the game, to the game, and then having to wait for the metal detectors and get to where you, where you seats. You know, people want something; they can just go and grab something really quick. So, um, so it's, it's you know, there are places where it's kind of worked well. I think in terms of like synergy, you could say, you know, like a place like the San Francisco Giants Stadium in uh, in South of Market, right, where they built it in a place that was kind of near the area that was already developing, but a little bit away from there, so it kind of expanded the, the zone of, uh, of activity. It was kind of down by the waterfront, a place that wasn't getting a lot of development otherwise. Um, so it kind of meshed well with development that was already happening. Um, and you can seek to do that, but you know, there's an equal number of places where you build a sports facility and then just nothing happens, you know? It just sits there empty for years. And the, uh, you know, uh, St. Louis Cardinals built their stadium, they, Planning to build this ballpark village thing across the street from it, and it was a big empty puddle of water for years. <laughs> um, so you know that that happens over and over again. Again, it's, it doesn't mean that that um, it's necessarily going to be a disaster, but it, it doesn't seem like by itself it encourages development. And you know, it really is just the fact that their sports facilities may be great when they're active, but they're dark most of the year, right? At right. best. If you have an arena that has a basketball team and a hockey team and a whole bunch of concerts, maybe you'll get like 200 nights a year that it's, that something is going on there, which means that every day, all day, and then the other 160 days a year, there's nothing going on there. Um, so it really, most facilities, certainly football stadiums, are you know big dark boxes that every once in a while a whole lot of people stream in and a whole lot of people stream back out three hours later and that's really not a great uh uh you know uh catalyst for economic development no absolutely you know we, uh, i'll use another analogy the boston uh democratic national convention um it uh it amplifies exactly what you spoke about in terms of the day of the big event the ironic part of the Boston Democratic National Convention was that on an economic level, for the people in that community, it was an outright disaster. 
um, for those right. not smart enough to negotiate some type of transfer payment in anticipation of it. The, the concept, of course, was that, that people would flood out a variety of times during the days, go out to local delis, go out to local restaurants. Well, a couple of things happened. First of all, people, the security was a nightmare, and as is security at major league events now. Um, so it discouraged, it scared, quite frankly, a lot of people off because of traffic issues and things like that. But as importantly, something like a convention, something like a major league sports stadium <clears throat> is in fact an insular, self-contained, almost geodesic dome-like business environment. They, I mean, aren't most stadiums designed to keep people in? I mean, aren't, don't they want to, I mean, the whole point of a new stadium is to monetize existing traffic at a higher level, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole idea of modern sports stadiums really is to, to bring spending inside the gates, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, the classic example there is Camden Yards, which, um, you know, literally took an entire street, Utah street, and then defined it inside the turnstiles. Uh, and gave lots of, you know, available link for, for stores that would be run by the Orioles. Um, you know, I remember, you know, having this argument with people when the Yankees were building their new stadium, and people were saying, oh, it'll do great things for the merchants on 161st Street. And it's like, the guys, the stadium's already on 161st Street. All you're doing is moving it across the street and making it much, much larger so you can fit in all these, like, steak houses and things right. like that so people can spend more money inside. There is no way people are going to be going down the street more to eat at the court deli. Um, and, uh, you know, sure enough, that was true. But um, it's a very hard lesson for people to hear when they haven't actually seen it in action or in inaction. Right. Now, you talk about the, the Giants. I, I mean, we need to point out, too, the difference between a major league franchise in a city that is literally a boom town with, in terms of disposable income versus, say, the, uh, the, the, the 21st century equivalent of the Music Man, where these cities, are, these stadiums, I'm sorry, are being pointed to, and, and, and what a, uh, a liberal friend of mine calls economic racism, pointed towards uh, declining communities with much lower marginal incomes, much lower levels of disposable income, um, in these pie in the sky, Hail Mary, as you put it, or as we like to say, I should say, build it and pray like hell someone shows up. Um, you, you know, they, the, the, you know, folks will point to a giant stadium or maybe even on the minor league level adore them, but those are dynamic economies. Those are, those are some of the uh, most dynamic economies in the country. I mean, most of these stadiums end up going to Shelbyville, don't they? Oh, sorry, I was going to say, in other words, most of these stadiums end up in, you know, lovely little towns that have nowhere near the level of economic activity that a San Francisco or even on a much smaller scale, a Roy Do Dorham has. Well, they, I mean, they end up everywhere, you know? I mean, that's the thing. It's like they, they, every city in the in the nation really has faced some kind of state arena controversy at some point. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, either you've got a team that's already there that's going to be, you know, asking for money, or you've got somebody down the road who's going to be saying, hey, maybe we can get some money out of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, increasingly, you've got something like MLS, which will come and in pretty much any mid-sized city in the country, hey, we'll give you a soccer team if you give us a stadium. Um, so, I, you know, I don't, I, I think, you know, the, the finance is a little different depending on whether it's a big city or a small city, but, you know, as someone who lives in a very large city, New York, um, I don't think that's necessarily like, oh, well, New York's got lots of money, so it's like, we don't, it doesn't matter if we spend it on a whole bunch of stadiums. Um, because, you know, I mean, Joanna and I first got into this because, my co and Joanna Kagan and I first got into this because, um, you know, New, she's from Cleveland originally, I'm from New York, and Cleveland was looking at uh, spending a whole lot of money, Cleveland's a decent sized city, was looking at spending a whole lot of money on the Browns, a new Brown Stadium, at the same time their schools were in receivership because they couldn't afford to keep them, you know, from, from uh, going bankrupt. And uh, New York City was talking about building a new stadium for the Yankees at the same time that they're closing libraries because they, because they didn't have enough money for that. So, I mean, you know, it's the same problem everywhere. It's, you know, the scale is different, certainly, when you're talking about New York versus Pawtucket. Um, but it really is the same problem everywhere, you know. It's the fight over what the role of government is. You know, is the role of government to help private business and then hope that the benefits will somehow trickle down to the public? Or is the role of government to do things that directly help the public and, you know, private business should, you know, if they want to 
make investments that you know take on their own risk um, for private profit, then that's great. But um, you know, it's not the job of the government and the people to guarantee those profits. It's basically what the sports industry is expecting. Right. Uh, full disclosure, I am chairman of the Rhode Island Libertarian Party, so I think you'll know where I come down on in terms of that argument. Um, we, uh, there was a little bit of controversy here on a local level because as a Libertarian Party, we submitted a uh, resolution to one of the towns, and we plan on taking this on the road, um, here, and, and the resolution, there was multiple parts of it, but the one part that, that folks seem to represent the biggest stumbling block. Now imagine, if you will, I'll, I'll use a New Jersey example. Um, you've got Elizabeth and you've got Newark, um, cities that roughly adjoin each other, uh, or we'll even say Hillside in, in Newark. Uh, if, if, if a stadium is built in Newark uh, adjoining Hillside, it is our argument on an economic level that there is a limited amount of disposable income in any one given economy. Uh, a baseball stadium is entertainment. And while it may occupy a special role in a certain part of the, uh, of the economy and, and those folks who are spending, uh, ultimately, that represents competition against other localized spending, particularly at the minor league level where, quite frankly, most of the draw is local. Not, in only a few minor league franchises are people actually traveling to see them. So my, our contention is if you live, say, in Hillside and you're paying taxes to the state of New Jersey and those taxes are being used in some part indirectly to, to fund this subsidy for this entertainment business in Newark, aren't you literally funding your competition for the, for the consumer dollar? I, it, it seems mm -hmm. re remarkably mm -hmm. straightforward to me. I, I mean, I, is it valid? I, you know, I, I, the, the, the Northern Rhode Island Chamber of Commerce who is, you know, literally the poster child for corporate welfare, has essentially implied that I was nuts. I, am I not, oh, okay, for, maybe for a whole lot of other reasons, no. but it, am I wrong? No, there are a lot of people who have the problem with it. It's even a matter of just, of, of uh, you know, the fact that you're spending money that you can't afford, but that you're skewing the, uh, you know, you're, you're, on, you're deleveling the playing field, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you're privileging certain, certain players over others. Um, and, you know, it's, I certainly heard people say, hey, you know, I run a small business. I would love to get my, you know, headquarters built for free by the state or the city, um, but I don't get to do that. Um, and meanwhile, you know, if you, you know, the, uh, if, especially if you're in the entertainment business, right, and you're running like a, a movie theater or a bowling alley or something like that, um, you really are a disadvantage if you're trying to uh, trying to compete with somebody who's getting, you know, huge amounts of subsidies. Um, and you know that's it's a huge problem, and that I mean, we're, we're we're getting back just to the issue of, of political power in this country. But um, the you know the question of you know who has the lobbying power, who has the um, you know access to uh, to demand um, uh, you know not just to demand public money, but to to demand the uh, ability to pitch these kinds of things, to put them on the ballot, and to bring them back year after year after year. Um, you know, one of the stories I talked about in, in uh, the latest edition of the book was talking to a uh, state senator from Minnesota who was saying, um, you know, been where they had fought back against uh, the Twins getting public money for a new stadium for years and years and years, and they finally approved it. They called us, what happened? And he said they wore us down, man. The lobbyists said, you know, kept coming back year after year after year. They right. said they weren't going to go away until we approved something. And you know, that's a powerful, powerful force. And it's not something that um, you know every little uh, you know owner of a corner store has. They can bring to bear. No, absolutely. And that's you know we call it political whack-a-mole here in Rhode Island. You're confronted on so many fronts if you're a whether you're a uh, a social justice activist, whether you're a, a civil liberties activist, or in this case, an economic uh, activist. It's just, it's this steady drumbeat. The casino people come back year after year to beg for more. Uh, and, the, and the baseball people seem to have an unrelenting appetite for yours, yours and mine tax dollars. Folks, we're going to take a quick break, but if you're just joining us, uh, we are privileged to have via telephone Neil DeMoss. Of course, Neil wrote a, what I consider to be literally the Bible for sports economics. Uh, that book, by the way, is available both on Kindle and in Amazon. Of course, we're talking about Field of Schemes, 
Uh, it's been updated. It is, as a taxpayer, even not as an activist, probably one of the best, like Kindle's got it for $12, one of the best $12 you'll ever spend because if you're like a couple of the members of the Cumberland Rhode Island Town Council who didn't seem to know anything about it and were rather unapologetic about the single biggest investment being made in Rhode Island in the last three years, um, maybe what we'll do, Neil, is actually we'll actually sponsor um, some, li some, 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 some copies, if you will. I, it, Tony, Tony Jones, write this down. He's our producer. Um, memo, free copies from the coalition of Field of Dreams to Dominic Ruggiero, the state center, fine, the state center president, as well as the Cumberland Town Council. P please note. Um, folks, we, we, we would be nowhere without our sponsors. We are commercial free, but what I'd like to do in a moment like this, this is sponsored, of course, by airscience.net. Air Science's focus is on identifying, correcting, and preventing environmental issues, including mold and viral and bacterial contamination, neutralizing them, duct cleaning, light waterproofing services in residential and commercial environments. Folks, airscience.net, improving the health of the indoor environment where you live, work, and most importantly, breathe. We ask you on the coalition to support our sponsors because these are folks heavily invested in the community and willing to take a highly public profile and supporting controversial, independent, and a week like this, very independent, outrage porn free media. So that's airsciences.net. Again, Neil DeMoss joining us via telephone from New York. Now, you know, there's, there's so many tools that are being used by these, uh, by the dark lords, if you will, of, of, of corporate cronyism. Um, very often, this is passed off. There's some per ticket tax, there's a beer tax, there's some type of syntax that's often used as a way of keeping people's eye off the ball because, well, they're paying for it, not you. But that's not really true. How, how prevalent at this point is the use of all these special revenue taxes to support these stadiums? Uh, you mean things like uh, like tax and refinancing, and you know where you're kicking back the the money that's uh, supposedly coming from from the building itself? Is that the idea? Yeah, or 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 even just ticket taxes, anything. I mean, what what, yeah. what type of economic yeah. mechanisms are they using to fund these and pay the pay the yeah. huge debt on these? T ticket taxes, I'm a little more okay with, if for, and not because of the oh, it's the uh, it's the uh, you know people who use it paying for it argument, because that's that's kind of bogus. Um, the reason that I am, am tend to be more okay with ticket taxes, and I think most economists are as well, um, is that when you think about it, basically teams are already charging as much as they possibly can for tickets, um, and they're in a market where they're not competing directly with other teams in the same sport, right? So it's not like, you know, if the Yankees raise their ticket prices from $40 to $50, they're, you know, worried that some other team is going to under come along and undercut the, under the market, right? Because they have a monopoly on the market, mm -hmm. um, or at least a duopoly with the Mets. Um, so the idea here is that if you have ticket taxes and you force the teams to charge more on top of that, they're going to have to keep lower or at least keep from raising their baseline ticket value, ticket prices um, because they simply lose money otherwise. They won't they won't be able to sell as many tickets. So a thousand a little more okay with. The problem is when it's tax money that otherwise would be coming, you know, under normal circumstances would be coming to the, the public treasury. Um, and it's all these things about like, you know, oh, you know, don't worry about it. It's, you know, it's all money. It's, it's sure you give up sales taxes and property taxes and, uh, you know, income taxes even on, uh, a, you know, a, a new building because, hey, if the team wasn't there, then you wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be getting those anyway, right? This is bringing in all new people from from uh, who otherwise wouldn't be spending in your city, or increasing spending that otherwise wouldn't be going on. And again, the economists have looked at this over and over again and found that it's just simply not true. What happens when you have um, you know a team that gets a new stadium, or even a team that moves to a new city, is people spend the exact same amount of money or close to the exact same amount of money. They just spend on something different. So, you know, if, uh, what's the team, you know, if, when the Raiders move to Las Vegas, right, um, people in Las Vegas are going to uh, spend the same amount of money they would have otherwise. They're just going to buy Raiders tickets instead of, buy, you know, going and doing something else in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, 
it helps a little bit if you get some travelers from other cities, right? Because it's like, oh, these people wouldn't have gone to your city if, they, if there weren't a team. But again, it's really small. You know, these little spring training, which is, you know, virtually all attended by, uh, by people from out of town. But mostly it's people from out of town who are going to Florida or Arizona anyway in March. And they're like, hey, let's go see a baseball game. So, you know, when there's, like, say, a player strike or a, or a lockout, and suddenly there's any spring training, the, you know, tax receipts of the cities just is absolutely flat. It doesn't change at all. Right. Uh, because people find something else to do with their money. Even the tourists find something else to do with their money. So it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say there's no benefit to uh, to new sports facilities in terms of uh, economic activity, but it's, you know, an order of magnitude smaller than, than what the teams pretend they are. Right. And, and uh, <laughs> conversely, should that team leave? Because the big threat, of course, being held over us is that Pawtucket will go to Worcester. <laughs> now, there, that's a whole other show, and there's a thousand reasons why I always like to say that I will get my Worcester Red Sox tickets on the way back from going to my Hartford Patriots game. Um, so there's, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a whole other story there. But here's the key point. There is a claim out there, and it's, it's rather unsubstantiated, but the claim is out there that the Pawtucket Red Sox generate $1.9 million in tax revenue a year. Should the Pawtucket Red Sox leave, it's our contention, and I, and I think you just supported that, that, okay, there's a transition, but people are going to spend that money anyway, aren't they? I, yeah. it, it, on just another entertainment function. Is, is there anything to lead to believe, in your experience and in your research, that particularly on the minor league level, where you don't have this national att attraction, which might draw some money, that that there's the potential for any lost revenue in most cities should a minor league baseball team or any other sports team leave. Uh, and yeah, there's no reason to believe. There's no reason to believe that you're going to lose lose any revenue, especially not from the state. You know, it's possible that there's some people coming from elsewhere in Rhode Island who are traveling to Pawtucket who might, you know, stay at home in in. Uh, Providence, you know, if they didn't uh, have a baseball game to go to um, and spend money there instead. But absolutely on a state level, you know, there's no possible way that there's a significant amount of, of, uh, of money being spent there. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that as somebody who, who myself travels around to go see games, and I'm hoping to go see a, a uh, Post Tucker Red Sox game sometime soon. I'm planning to do it this year. Um, but that said, you know, me going to one game is not going to make a huge dent in the uh, in the Rhode Island uh, economy. You know, most of it's from people who are going who are going on a regular basis, and those people are going to find something else to do. You know, whether they can, whether it's going to the movies or going to dinner or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is not to poo poo the loss of a team. If you are a fan, then you get into the whole question of, like you said, is the threat real or is it just? You know, trying to pretend that there's, there's some city out there um, you can you know gin up a uh, a uh, a smooth threat with. Um, but even aside from that, you know, um, yeah, sure, if a team leaves, it's sad, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily sad for economic reasons. It's just sad for emotional reasons. Um, and then you have to figure out what kind of price tag you put on that. And when there have been studies, I have to say, of what the price tag is that people would put on the value of just of having a team. Mm -hmm. um, it again is way, way lower than you, than you would expect. It's more in the tens of millions of dollars for a major league team, and probably you know single millions of dollars or tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for a minor league team than the kind of money that's actually being put out. Well, you know, and and as we get into some of the statistics, it brings up the larger question. Um, very often, and, 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 it, and it seems that there's almost a cottage industry of economic consultants who prognosticate uh, on the future ongoing revenues and the potential for economic development. Uh, the firm that is did the study for the city of Pawtucket and the Pawtucket Red Sox, ironically, was the same firm that did a study for the Ryan Center, which is named after, ironically, one of the <laughs> owners of the Pawtucket Red Sox, a guy named Ryan, who was the CEO of CVS. Um, in that study in King, North Kingstown, it, it turns out that they, oops, they overestimated attendance at that over a protracted period of time by about 30% to the tune of almost 1 million attendees. Here we go again. They are back at it, predicting all sorts of windfalls. Um, 
Publishers Clearinghouse, I think they even predicted, would show up at McCoy Stadium with a check to the Pawtucket Red Sox. Um, these, these firms that are out there doing this prognosticating, they, you know, consulting as they call it, um, what's your sense of them? I mean, how often are they right? How often are they wrong? And, and how do they normally skew, from your experience at least? I mean, it's hard to, it's generally hard to kind of go back and retroactively figure out what people, whether what people predict you was right because the predictions are so hazy. Um, and it's, you know, oftentimes hard to figure it out. But I think, you know, in general, the prognostications are extremely rosy. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. And they're more geared as, you know, PR documents than as something that's actually going to be, um, you know, something you can go back and look and say, oh, yeah, that actually uh, came to pass or not. Um, you know, again, I think there's, there are a few stadiums that where the price tag was low enough and the things worked out well enough that you can say, okay, fine, you know, the, the public did not get posed in that case. Um, but those are the exceptions, you know. Um, and in general, you know, when you're, when you're talking about putting up, again, whether it's several hundred millions of dollars for a major league team stadium or tens of millions of dollars for a minor league stadium, it's like, no way you're going to earn it back. I mean, it's just like you, you would have, every single person going to the game would have to, you know, spend like $500 to, you know, to make it even out. Yeah, I, I don't know if there are many legal ways you could spend $500 right now in Pawtucket. Um, the, um, <laughs> Yeah. Well, Maybe one of those really big, those really big, like, uh, you know, helmets full of ice cream or something. Yeah, I, I yeah, what, what, what do you say after a while? Um, what's your sense a, 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 of the future of these stadium subsidies? There, there are those of us who are trying to be optimistic. You know, I guess in Virginia, you just had a, uh, a rollback, um, or at least for now. And as you pointed out so aptly, um, they'll be back, it seems like. But do you sense that the nation is wise to this? In, in, in no small part, by the way, from your efforts. Have we grown up? Have we learned lessons yet? You know, I, I wish I could say that. Um, you know, it would be nice to feel like, like uh, we, I, I, what I've been doing and a lot of other people have been doing has made some progress over the last 20 years. And I think it has a little bit, you know, in that um, it's harder for team owners just to go and say, hey, we want $300 million and for, um, state legislature just say, oh yeah, sure, fine, you know, because right. there will be pushback. But there was pushback originally, you know, it was pushback when the Colts moved, to, were, you know, trying to get money out of Baltimore, and it was pushback when the, you know, uh, Orioles and the Cleveland Indians, you know, it's, 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 there's been opposition that's going all the way back, um, including from sports fans, you know, who don't particularly want to see tax money going to their, you know, team owners who they already have paid through the nose of the box office for tickets to. So, um, you know, there's always been opposition, and I think, um, you know, the problem is, you know, like I was saying, that the, the teams only have to win once, you know. You can have a batting average of, uh, of 100, um, but that means that nine years in a row you did get a stadium, and in the 10th you did, and, you know, you cashed in at that point. The one thing I'm slightly optimistic about, and this is, you know, very tentative and it could, you know, be a ripple that then passes, but there are a, there's a handful of, like, mayors and local elected officials now who seem to be getting it. Who seem to be getting that the idea is, you know, you don't just say, oh, okay, you know, you want a new stadium, you know, uh, how, how much money do you need? Um, and, and we'll find a way to come up with it. But, okay, you want something, you want a new building, what's in it for us? You know, what, tell us, how, you know, come up with a deal that where we can explain that this is actually going to be a benefit for citizens. And, you know, you've got um, mayors like Tom Tate in Anaheim and Nahi Nenshi in Calgary and, you know, the mayors of Oakland and uh, Minneapolis who have all sort of taken this tack um, to some degree the Seattle City Council has, um, in part because citizens there went and voted in an initiative that, uh, uh, you know, forced the city to use is this, are taxpayers actually going to get some kind of return on investment from it as the criterion? Um, so it, it's, I feel like there's some slow motion in the right direction. But again, you know, there are plenty of cities where this is not happening, and Nevada getting three quarters of a billion dollars to the Raiders. Um, and it's just such a big business that it's not going to get, you know, even if the needle is starting to shift a little bit in the right direction, um, I still think it's going to be. Uh, I don't know, at least another couple of decades before we finally put a stake to this in heart. What, uh, 
what, uh, let's talk about you a little bit. We only have a few minutes left. I, I am so grateful that you were able to take this much time. I know you've got a very hectic schedule, a lot of irons in the fire. What's, uh, what's on the immediate horizon, both in terms of authorship, consul- what, what, where is Neil DeMoss going to be seen next? Uh, well, I'm always at my website, fieldofskeeves.com. Um, I have started writing for Deadspin, which has always been one of my favorite ah. websites. I'm very happy to be there. Great. Um, just wrote a piece this week about uh, about uh, the Seattle situation I was just telling you guys about. Um, and, um, you know, continuing to, to write for The Voice um, about a uh, myriad of subjects. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I want to, I want definitely want to explore what's been going on in Cleveland because I don't know if you've been following it, but the, uh, um, you know, there was a year-long battle over this money that the that Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers, um, was trying to get to renovate the stadium, which most most of them building a new giant glass wall to front it, and uh, there was a big public push by a huge coalition to, you know, try and have a referendum to try and get rid of, you know, to try and repeal the, the what the City council or county council, I forget it was, approved, and they you know, got a court to a rule that it was going to go on the ballot in November, and uh, the county said, okay, fine, we don't, you know, we're not even going to try at that point. And then, as it turned out, Dan Gilbert, um, or not even Dan Gilbert, the county went to one of the coalition members that had actually filed the petitions and said, well, how about if we build you a couple of mental health clinics instead? Would that buy you off? And they were like, oh yeah, sure, that would be fine, and they went through the petitions. Right. So, <laughs> that's fabulous. A story, and I really want to find out what the inside story was there and um, explore a little bit more. So maybe that'll be a future Deadspin article. I'm not sure. Well, you know, and I've I've put the notion out there to the Pentecost Red Sox that I am for sale. Um, if you want to build me a mental health clinic, I could probably use it at this point after 30 years in Rhode Island. But um, yeah, about that, folks. Neil DeMoss, Field of Schemes, How the Great Stadium Swindle Turns Public Money into Private Profit. It can be found on Amazon.com. It is also available on Kindle. Uh, DeMoss.net, that's your other website, right? DeMoss.net is where I post all my other articles that are not, yeah, Field of Schemes, stuff for voice and best places like that. Right. So that's, if, if folks want to follow a really unique voice in American literature right now, they can follow that DeMoss.net, of course, that's spelled D-E-M-A-U-S-E.net. When we post this interview, and this, this will be posted on the coalitionradio.us and our YouTube channel, uh, we will post all of these links. Uh, folks, this is, these are must-reads. These are, this is, you know, I, I, I don't say this often, but it's a destination site. It's destination reading, appointment reading, um, because contrary to popular opinion, there is still great writing to be had out there. There is still great journalism. There is still great investigative reporting. You gotta look a little harder, uh, but clearly the Village Voice, DeMoss.net, is one of the places to go. Uh, listen, again, thank you so much for adding your unique perspective, your experience perspective, your, your wisdom to this situation. Uh, it means a lot to us who are fighting this fight in Rhode Island. I wanna say for the record, uh, you know, if you come up here to Pawtucket, uh, you know, the night's on us. I probably won't be allowed in the stadium with you, but <laughs> 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 um, you know, uh, the, uh, Mr. Tamburo of the Pawtucket Red Sox made that crystal clear Wednesday night. Um, so if you get a chance, if, if you need some light nighttime reading, you have a little problem getting to sleep, go to coalitionradio.us where all of this will, will be found. And you can look with amusement at our own little, as I like to call it, monorail, monorail, monorail. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Glad we were able to make it work. Great. And I hope you'll stay in touch. Again, folks, Neil DeMoss, Field of Schemes, fieldofschemes.com, and of course, demoss.net, where you can find his writing. That's uh, a great, great website. Village Voice, really, but, but take a moment, read the book. Um, particularly for the folks uh, in the Cumberland Town Council, I think you know who you are. Um, we're going to do our best to educate you on this over the next couple months. We'll do it in a variety of ways, and certainly uh, this will be one of them. Folks, you have, in fact, for the last hour, been listening to The Coalition on the Worldwide Coalition Media Network, broadcasting live here at the Go Local Live Broadcaster Center, 90 Way Boston Street, here in the heart of the city we love. It's HasCon tonight, as opposed to the Pawtucket Red Sox, which is has been. However, the... Show can be found at coalitionradio.us, facebook.com slash the coalition radio, on the mighty, mighty Twitter at coalition underscore radio, 
in our apolitical, all paw socks, all crony capitalists, all... It's exhausting after a while. Everything you need to know about the stadium at Pawtucket is home. And of course, please, there's a petition at fightthestadium.com. Please go there. We're going to post this, and we've got a whole bunch of updated articles in addition to Reason Magazine's contributions on 